Hello and welcome to Pitt Street Research. My name is Stuart Roberts and I'm one of the co-founders of our firm. And joining me on the morning of Wednesday, the 31st of January, 2024 from Melbourne is Dr. Nina Webster, who is the CEO of Dimerix, ASX DXB. Nina, good morning. Morning, Stuart. Nina, now is a good time to be you because uh, uh, we're just on the cusp of February. After February comes March. And uh, you flagged to the market that by sometime in mid-March, you'll be in a position to read out your first interim analysis of the study that you're doing right now, uh, which is, is your, your pivotal study. Uh, so uh, you're about to hit the big time. Absolutely, you're, you're right. Uh, we've got the phase three clinical study running in a disease called focal segmental glomerulosclerosis or FSGS. It's a rare type of kidney disease. Um, and that's running globally at the moment. And the first readout from that is expected in mid-March on track right. for that. Right. So that's with the first block of, of about 72 patients that you, you've recruited. Um, yeah, you, you intend to recruit another 72 uh, and, and then do a, a longer analysis point, which would bring, bring on uh, accelerated approval. And then there's more uh, recruitment after that. Now, FSGS being a, a rare disease, it's hard to find patients. So pretty much one trial center equals one patient. How's it going on the recruitment right now? Yes, it's, it's going really well. Um, obviously, we'll give an update when we come out in March and exactly where recruitment is for the second interim analysis. Um, but recruitment is going really well. The intention, uh, which, which is uh, what's in all of the presentations we put out to date, is that once we get past that March, we will also open more clinical sites. So we've got over 70 clinical sites open at the moment. We will increase the number of sites post March so that we can then increase the recruitment rate even more. Right. And uh, the opportunity is, is magnificent. Uh, focal segmental glomerulonephritis sclerosis, many of our, our viewers, if they don't know, dimerics will have never heard of this. Uh, rare disease, but for those who have it, um, uh, potentially a death sentence at some point. Um, at the very least, a kidney transplant that may or may not work in the, in the long term. Talk to us about potentially what we can treat. Yeah, absolutely. So FSGS um, is that rare type of kidney disease that we just mentioned. Uh, unfortunately, there are no uh, uh, treatments anywhere in the world at the moment that are available. And for those who do get a transplant, around 60% get reoccurring FSGS in the transplanted kidney, and nobody knows why. So this is where it's, it's such a high unmet need in all of those territories. It affects children as young as two years old, as well as adults. And that's why uh, in the uh, study moving forward, we will be recruiting some pediatrics into this study as well, uh, being that rare disease. Right. Um, and encouragingly, um, given that it's an orphan disease uh, and you've got orphan drug designation in both uh, Europe, North America, and I understand China, is, is China uh, 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 have an orphan drug program? Not specifically orphan drug in China. What we'd be looking for in China is the breakthrough designation, which gives us the same sort of benefits that orphan um, designation does in US and Europe. Right. But as an orphan uh, drug, potentially um, uh, th this drug can charge out at uh, what by uh, pharmaceutical industry standards would be very high levels. Talk to us about potentially um, uh, the, the market opportunity in the light of it being an orphan drug. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a number of advantages actually and benefits of developing a product in orphan disease. So orphan disease by its definition is a rare disease. In FSGS, it affects over 200,000 people globally. And as such, um, the, the, with those numbers that we get a number of incentives from the regulatory agencies to develop products. So orphan drug pricing is one of those incentives. The average orphan drug retails for around seven thousand US dollars per patient per month. It's about eighty four thousand uh, dollars per year. And another drug uh, approved recently for a different type of rare disease is now priced at almost ten thousand US dollars per patient per month or around one hundred and twenty thousand per year. That makes a disease such as FSGS a really attractive market. In addition, we also get that exclusivity. Uh, that means that during that exclusivity period, seven years in US, 10 years in Europe, no generic can enter the market and our patents cannot be challenged. But that is also very valuable uh, for us, particularly when talking with our licensing, potential licensing partners. Right. And to that end, we, we obviously have at least uh, one uh, uh, licensing partner with uh, last year's deal with uh, Advanced Pharma, uh, mainly for, for uh, Europe. But there's still, um, there's still plenty of, uh, of territories that you have yet to license to, particularly the all-important US market. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Europe represented approximately 20% of the global opportunity. So we still have 80% of the globe left to go in terms of, of that marketing opportunity. 
Um, we're in the uh, process of having those discussions. They are progressing nicely with each of those territories, and we look forward to updating market in due course on those uh, negotiations. Right. Now, um, uh, we all know that the commercial opportunity is exciting. Uh, frankly, right now, the, the, the market's not, uh, I don't think, appreciating that. Now, um, uh, you're capped at the moment uh, at the current share price at about $95 million. Uh, I, so we learned from the 4C this week, 15 million of that is cash. So yes. um, $80 million for a, for a, a, a multi-billion orphan drug opportunity. And uh, NASDAQ and other markets know how to price uh, orphan drugs. Why do you think um, you need a magnifying glass to see the share price right now? Well, this is it. I mean, uh, it, it's certainly a big opportunity, I think, for Dimerics at the moment and Dimerics shareholders, uh, given where we are priced at the moment and where this could go, given the potential market opportunity. Uh, with the data outcome in literally, what, six weeks' time, uh, it's a very near-term opportunity, I think, that, that we should be looking at. Right. And what encourages me is uh, I've looked at all the data uh, since, since uh, the DMX 200 program started. Um, uh, it's fair to say that, uh, the, it, it, albeit small patient numbers in phase two, it's fairly compelling. There is a, a, a big difference in, um, in glomular flow rate for treated patients versus untreated controls. Once you add DMX200 to uh, standard of care um, um, uh, ARB, angiotensin receptor blocker, uh, that's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, talk to us about what the clinical data is telling you. Yes, yeah, so uh, exactly right. In the phase two clinical trial, it was what we call a double blind crossover study. What that means is every drug patient received drug and placebo. They just didn't know which order with a washout between. That meant it was very, very powerful because we can compare the patient to themselves when they were on drug versus placebo. What we saw is, is, is an 89% reduction in um, drug in uh, proteinuria in patients on drug versus placebo. Why proteinuria? That is an excellent measure of kidney disease progression. A, a healthy kidney should have no protein in the urine. So a healthy person, there's no protein in the urine. What happens is as the kidney becomes quite scarred and damaged over time, it becomes quite leaky and you end up with protein spilling into the urine. So measuring protein in the urine really helps us determine how the rate of progression of kidney disease is occurring. So by decreasing that, it means that we are improving that kidney function as a surrogate marker. And that's right. what we look for. So that that um, that reduction that we saw in that phase two is very compelling to move into the phase three. So we recently uh, published a, 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 an initiation report on, on Dimerics. And obviously, uh, we, we think our valuation is orders of magnitude higher than the, the, the current share price. But what I was particularly excited about um, in, when we did the research was how uh, regulatory agencies like the FDA are becoming more, uh, more comfortable with uh, surrogate markets of, of, uh, of disease. In this case, proteinuria, as you say, is an indication that there's a, a disease condition. And that if you knock down proteinuria, it, it, it looks better. EGFR is, is, the, um, is the, the industry standard at the moment. Before then, you had to wait till people had end-stage renal disease, and that's a long wait. Um, and that's a relatively recent phenomenon. Why do you think the, the agencies are so comfortable with, with these um, uh, surrogate markets? Yeah, it's a great question. I think this comes back to, to historical, as you said. Um, so for, for a long time, uh, kidney studies had to run for um, you know around 10 years or so because they had to run until the kidneys failed or the patient died. So you can imagine it would take thousands of patients and often decades to do. So for over 20 years, there was no innovation in kidney disease at all. Now, kidney disease is one of the largest issues in the world. So there was a need to find uh, ways to get products developed for kidney disease treatment. So in 2018, the FDA and the EMA, along with a, a number of national bodies, got together to talk about what can those uh, incentives be. And one of those was the realization that you can use these surrogate markers to demonstrate that you're improving kidney function and therefore you don't have to wait for end stage renal failure. And as a result, it meant that there's a number of companies working in the kidney space now and you can look at transactions in the kidney space, it's becoming hot property. Fortunately, Dimerics is the only product in phase three for FSGS. So we really are at the forefront of what we're doing. Right. And uh, and this is the year where, where um, we, we, uh, we find out how, how, how good it is. You must be pretty excited right now. Yeah, pretty excited. It's, it's coming up pretty fast. So we're trying to get uh, everything ready on this end so we can get this out to market as quickly as possible when that comes in. Okay. Nina Webster, on behalf of all those FSGS patients, not to mention the Dimeric shareholders, uh, thank you for your service and, uh, and, and good luck uh, in uh, March 15th or thereabouts. Thank you very much, Stuart. Appreciate it.